Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is sponsored by the Wedgeside Media Collective store. Right now, you can pick up a new tote design that we have. It's the vegan thank you design. You know those plastic bags that you get at the grocery store that say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, have a nice day? Well, think about those, only they're not plastic. They're on these nice cotton canvas bags. And instead of saying thank you, it says vegan a bunch of times. It, it still says have a nice day because seriously, have a nice day. Yeah, so you know, you're showing everyone that you're awesome and vegan and you're also saving the environment. And so, you know, you just have that bag on you at all times and it'll make everyone feel lesser than you and like they're not doing as good as you. You know, I'm completely biased on this one, but um, it's my favorite grocery bag I own. It's a pretty good grocery bag. I like it. Sturdy. Uh, I mean, it's a good bag, but I just, I love the design. It, it just screams awesomeness to me. Comes in red and green. Um, I love both of them. I think they're both fantastic. So uh, go order yourself up some. Right now they're on sale for seven fifty for the introductory price. Normally ten dollars. Yeah, so go and pick them up now. You have until the end of the month to get them at that seven dollar fifty cent price. So just go to witchsidecollective.org and pick them up. No promo code needed. This is episode 196. Yeah, we talk with John Kinsella. You know, John is one of those guys that you, when you talk to, you realize uh, you don't know shit. No, but really, just a really fascinating guy. Um, he's a poet, uh, a teacher. Um, and a vegan anarchist pacifist. Yeah, and we go into all of those. So I abs- it's one of those conversations that once you start, you don't want to end. And when you end it, you're like, I have to have this more. It, yeah, it's it's a fantastic conversation. We literally could have gone for another couple hours. Oh, easy, mm-hmm. easy. Yeah. So uh, stick tuned. Uh, hope you enjoy, and uh, we plan to have him on again. Hey, Jordan, what news investor are we going on this week? Well, if you are in the Salt Lake area on Tuesday, August 9th, check out the Anarchist Black Cross Prisoner Letter Writing Night. It's at the West Valley City Library at 7 p.m. If you can't make it to that, you should write a prisoner on your own terms. Um, also, if you're in Salt Lake City on August 10th, there's a Salt Lake City Veg Fest volunteer training night. Um, that's from 6 to 7 o'clock. So if you're interested in the Veg Fest that's coming up on September 10th here in Salt Lake City, you should go check that out. We'll be there with uh, sharing a booth with Vegan Warrior Princesses Attack. Yeah. So come check us both out. If you like the opening sequence of the film Unity by Sean Monson, the sequence is actually from a documentary called Life in the Slaughterhouse, and it'll be broadcast on the internet for free for 24 hours on Tuesday, the 16th of August. So you can check that out at cultureunplugged.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. I don't know if you remember, but we talked about that uh, opening sequence with Sean um, it's a pretty like impactful sequence. You know, go check it out uh, for sure. Indirect action news. Here's some recent events that have happened. We had four chickens rescued. Enclosures were damaged at a zoo and an owl was freed. A hundred hens were liberated by the ALF. Rabbits were rescued. Butcher shops were sabotaged. Crow was liberated and traps trashed and snares removed. Keep it up. There was a USA one in there. Way to go, USA. We're going to win the Olympics. USA. Direct action Olympics. <laughs> USA. We're, we're pretty fucking far behind right now. <laughs> yes. We're trailing on that yeah, one. We are. For the slingshot this week, August 11th, 1965. That's my birthday. Yeah, I was going to bring that up too, but you couldn't hold off. But I couldn't. I'm yeah, so you just excited. couldn't hold off. It's also Jordan's birth. He wasn't born in 1965, but... Uh, but yeah, it is Jordan's birthday. Mm-hmm. So uh, wish him a happy birthday. No, don't. And then uh, also in 1965, that's when the Watts Rebellion begins in Los Angeles. Do you, do you, have you ever had a Watts Rebellion themed birthday party? <laughs> I should. <laughs> Next year. 
<laughs> my big 3-0. So uh, go get your shit organized and get a Slingshot Personal Organizer. You can get one at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. And uh, remember, wish Jordan a happy birthday. <laughs> Send him a little message, a little, little tweet or a little Instagram. Sure. A little emoji with a cake and candles. Or send real cake. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go have some pie right after this. So, nice. Uh, sweet. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. How's your day going so far? Well, it's beginning of the day here, oh, so right. um, in the future. We are in the future, <laughs> always in the future. <laughs> Is the future good for us? Um, well, uh, there's probably about the same amount of environment degradation as yesterday, maybe a bit more. Um, the sun is shining here, which is after um, a kind of very rainy night. So I don't know if that much of that will come across your way, but who knows? <laughs> so, so do you do you find yourself having a, a general good disposition towards life in general, uh, especially coming from being you know like a, the activist background? Um, well, I, I, I'm a you know a glass half full kind of guy. I always think that it's never too late. And my activism is driven by the belief that, um, you know, regardless of how far things have gone, we can always pull them back. Um, we are on the brink environmentally in so many ways. However, I do think that um, it's never too late. Action is always going to produce positive results. So I do have an optimistic kind of disposition, I guess, a positive disposition. However, I'm pretty pretty hardcore. I... Um, I track and witness um, what goes on in great detail, not only just in my living life, but in my work. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's grim. We've pushed, the humans have pushed um, the biosphere to the point of almost collapse, but it is savable and um, we can do very positive things. So, yeah, I basically have, I mean, I, I, I love life and I love all living things. And I feel very uh, warm and positive towards life and all its forms. It, it makes no difference what that life is. You know, um, what people call good and bad are really relevant terms to me. I believe in the kind of um, necessity and efficacy and purple, uh, purposefulness, if you like, of um, existence. So, yeah, I guess I'm positive. How do you stay positive and keep from burning out and just getting disheartened with the way the world is? Well, you know, I, I've got the strong belief that, you know, I'm a, I'm a poet, I'm a, I write in all genres, but I, my, my life is based around poetry and that's primarily what I've been known as. But um, I, I find the, the writing of poetry a very generative act, a very, um, you know, uh, positive and um, uh, energetic and um driving kind of force so a lot of my um positive attitude has come from dealing with complex um ecological and ethical issues generally ethical issues through poetry so i find that kind of reinforcing i find art in general um a positive thing for me art's just not something you uh, it's curatorial, as I call it. It's not something you display so people can enjoy themselves and have a time out. For me, art in all its forms is uh, a positive interaction with um, with existence. It has an ontological purpose. And um, that, I think, is how I retain a, a generally positive disposition. I mean, some people would say I was far from positive because I can be pretty um, full on in what I've got to say about what's going on and what has gone on and so on. But uh, I do believe that through art and through kind of um, making even the most micro um, ethical decisions that are generative and that in some way use less, that are less consumerist, that are, that are less invasive and so on, they can bring great changes. Small effects can have big effects. 
what what is your your origin? So you 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 say you, you're a vegan anarchist. So what is your origins to veganism and then anarchism? And then how did you start manifesting that self into your artwork? Oh right. Well, this is interesting because it's a, a, a quite a peculiar journey. I describe myself as a vegan anarchist pacifist. The pacifist part's very important because you know many anarchists I've known over my life, and I've known many have um, a more if not aggressive, a more assertive revolutionary attitude to change and that um, sudden change, which is often can be violent, um, produces long-term betterment, if you like, for, for all individuals. I don't share that belief. I, I have something called umbrella anarchism uh, in which we coexist um, within, well, in, in this case, a liberal democracy, um, and we move towards uh, anarchist states on micro levels, on small levels. Everything for me is about size. I'm not interested in large things. I'm interested in small things and small groups of people being able to reach consensus, mutual decision-making, and so on. But I'll get to that in a minute. It's quite... It's, it's This is 30 years of writing and thinking about this. It's not, um, you know... Being a teenager and angry, I've been a lot um, <laughs> angry and wanting, you know, I, I do. That's what I came out of. I came out of some you know, very uh, um, strong and decisive kind of standpoints. How it all began really for me is that um, I have uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in the rural world. Um, it's a big part of my life. Um, brought up around weapons um, in the Western Australia, uh, hunted did all those things, fished, all those kinds of things. When I was very young, um, I was heavily interested in uh, military history, um, strategy and tactics, all these kinds of things when I was in my early teenage years. By my mid-teenage years, I, I was a very, very wide reader and um, I lived up in the country, in the bush, and I used to go down to the city, which is about 400 kilometres away, and buy... I used to save up and buy huge quantities of books and um, I started reading various anarchist philosophers and thinkers, Kropotkin, um, Malatesta, various other people, and I started thinking, hmm, that's not where I'm at now, but that's where I began. There's a different way of doing all this. Gradually over those years, teenage years, my politics defined themselves. I gave up things like uh, shooting and hunting I um, started thinking about how I ate, um, but I wasn't. I turned vegan when I was 22. Uh, but that process of late teenage years through to 22, I travelled the world, did all sorts of things, backpacks through Asia, and you know, travelled through Europe, those kind of things. Which for someone where I came from wasn't that usual then. It's very common now, but it wasn't usual then. And I I started generating um, a different way of seeing the world and the way that I've been brought up with. Having said that, I had a very uh, liberated mother, very, very liberated mother, um, who had an unusual life, put herself through university as a mature age student and uh, had some very strong feminist views and so on. So I had an interesting cross-pollinated background, if you like, of uh, rural conservatism um, mixed with just uh, the isolation of Western Australia from the rest of the world with some quite radical kind of ideas. All of it was um, became very peaceful. It, you know, I was a uh, alcoholic and I had all sorts of other issues uh, for many years and that also fed into this kind of notion that I could change. I had to. I was dropped dead basically. And so over those years I started to really formulate this alternative view of um, of living and veganism, as I said, came when I was 22. I'd been in India. I'd seen Jains. They really interested me. Um, they lived without eating animals and so on. And I, when I got back to Australia, I kind of I became a vegetarian for three months. I, was li then I went and lived on a dairy farm uh, just because that's where we could get a house out in the country. And I saw what was happening to the sort of cows being you know, literally turned into machines um, and within three months, we, the three of us living in this sort of house, communal house, became vegans. And that's 30 years ago last Wednesday. So I've been a vegan for 30 years now. Um, yeah. So it's an, been an amazing journey in that way. The politics, the anarchism, as I said, formed through reading and just developing a 
a sense of the world that wasn't um, about hierarchies and power. And I was very interested in communal living. I lived in various commune situations uh, in the southwest of Western Australia, no electricity and just groups of people growing veganic vegetables, uh, all these kinds of things. And that was my life for quite some time. Uh, so these things kind of set, and the pacifism came from as a logical extension. I just saw, especially as an alcoholic with various other substance issues, I saw a lot of violence and uh, it never never did any good and generated nothing. And in the protest movement, I was heavily involved in all sorts of protest movements, every time they got out of hand and there was aggression, the message finished. No one was interested. It was wrong anyway. And um, it felt wrong to me uh, every time there was aggression. And so it quickly became two things, logic, it said that A, it doesn't work, but B, because if you value life as I really do, um, in any way damaging it um, on a minor or major level is just a contradiction. So I, the pacifism became a very big part of who I am because I saw a lot of violence and um, traveling through Southeast Asia and Asia during the time I did in the uh, early and mid 80s, um, you know, there were some pretty heavy things going on in parts of the world I visited and I saw some pretty disturbing things and it made me realize that life is a very precious thing. So these things coalesced and, um, you know, I've been raised two children, vegan, uh, they're, they've done very well. These things have to be done very consciously and carefully. Uh, none of it's been, you know, feeding a bit of lettuce leaf and saying, oh, that's right. It's a very thoroughly thought out kind of uh, life system, um, making sure all sorts of uh, nutritional um, needs are met and so on. So it's not just a, um, sitting back on the veranda, eating the lettuce leaf and um, saying, you know, get stuffed world. It's not like that at all. It's a very <laughs> positive engagement with things. Well, you know, the thing is, that's all right. I've got no objection to people sitting on their <laughs> veranda. The left. Not at all. I'm just saying that I actually want to, I actually want to too. See, the funny thing is when I was young, I was a great proselytizer of these views. I really went full on, especially when I was a drinker. I went full on at people and said, you know, this is the way. You learn very quickly that that way of being is just absolutely ineffective and ineffectual and um, quite offensive uh, to behave that way. So what instead I've done over the last 30 years is I've developed a way of, you know, I show people you can live this way and if you find it interesting, well, then I'm happy to talk about it and show you what we've done, myself and my partner and children and so what we've done and, you know, it might be interesting to you. And that's a much more effective way of bringing change rather than trying to aggressively change people. And that's why, that's why I am on a very different thread from more aggressive anarchists who believe that, you know, we, we go out and we wear our masks and we, you know, go to the protest and take it over and be aggressive and show the state what we think. It doesn't work. It's, a, it, it's, it's morally offensive to me. And um, it's really about one's own angst and internal issues rather than about the cause of, you know, the world and humanity and, and animals for that matter. So anyway, it's a, it's a reasoned position. It's come about over a long period of time. And, um, I'm, you know, I don't have too many gaps in it, I don't think. I'm very much about trying to be consistent and uh, live as consistently and um, honestly to what I believe as I can. It's not a matter of putting one front onto the public and have secretly another life, which I've seen a lot of, <laughs> believe you me. A lot of people I, I've known in activist circles are fantastic when, on, when they're on the stage or in the front of the, the rally or whatever they are, and they live very different lives with all their gadgets and all the other stuff. And that's fine. People having, you know, people make their own decisions. But where I have a problem is the, is the amount of slippage. There's always some because, you know, sitting here I'm using a, uh, you know, an internet connection and so on, um, which, you know, is part of the problem. But uh, you make some decisions uh, where you think it will benefit more than it will damage. The degree of those decisions is where one can be challenged and where they're contestable. But um, I think you do need some notion of right and wrong and how you're personally going to approach it. You know, anarchism in the end, I'm a socialist anarchist. I believe in communal and social 
decision making and living. But um, in the end, anarchism is very much about individual rights and individual decisions and taking individual responsibility. But that doesn't mean the kind of individual responsibility where I don't care if the next person is being looked after health wise or is starving because I'm only concerned about myself. I'm not remotely interested in that kind of. That's a thread of American individualist anarchism. We lived in America for many years and uh, the various anarchists I came across in America quite often were driven by that um, uh, American individualist uh, kind of take on. So, in other words, it fitted qu- the libertarian kind of values that fitted quite well with some things I find deeply disturbing, like, uh, you know, the whole kind of market-driven economy and so on. I'm, I mean, I'm a barter-based person, for God's sake. I don't, even, I don't believe in money. I believe that, you know, if I have something that, you know, is useful to you, we can share. I can, you can, I can grow some vegetables and swap them, for, you know, for some of your labor or whatever. I, I literally believe in those basic um, uh, human interactions of sharing and uh, barter and so on. So, I'm a long way from a lot of other anarchist kind of uh, threads, but it is anarchism. And it's, um, as I said, it's a very carefully thought out, and, and I've written a lot about it, um, this, this position, if you like. You, you, you brought up a whole bunch that, that I'd like to touch base on, um, but what, one of the things that, that I want to go into a little bit more is you talk about the importance of the, the pacifist label. And in your little definition of, of pacifism, I completely find myself fitting into but I, right. yeah, I don't label myself as a pacifist, though, because I do believe in some stages that violence needs to be met with violence and that the lack of that can only help those within the actual power structure. Right. So I, well, I, I, w- I want to get your take on that. Well, I understand the position that you have. And look, all of us have felt deep frustration when we see violence meted out against people who who can no way defend themselves or even stand up for themselves. Of course, one feels that. Um, And I think that any complex view of life and this, you know, Derrida used to talk about complex thinking. And this is a complex thinking issue. Mm -hmm. There are no simple answers. You know, this is an old thing that gets thrown at vegans all the time. What would happen if a tiger was attacking your child? Would you hurt the tiger to stop it attacking your child? Now, there's a no-brainer. As if you'd stand there and say, oh, eat my child, you know. Of course you'd intervene. Of course you would. It's, it's a natural reaction and obviously you've got a responsibility and you're going to prioritize in the moment certain things. So everything I said is within the context of knowing that in situations of pressure, when you're witnessing something extreme, you may react. However, having said that, my decision has for a long time now been to, you know, literally turn the other cheek as the old saying goes. And I have had it physically, I have physically received quite a lot of violence in my life and in um, the last 20 years I have, or 22 or 23 years, I've turned the other cheek and I've copped it and often ended up, you know, this is where I've been talking about pacifism. I've actually done lectures on pacifism and been attacked. I mean, mm-hmm. people get very, very upset about the notion of nonviolent reaction. They want to test you. Now, I genuinely believe that the moment you react to a violent situation with violence, you perpetuate it. Now, you may, in the particular instance, stop something. You may stop further violence happening. But what it becomes is uh, a template or a model for further violence because the violent will always um, find more violence to feed on. Now, I've seen this. I've watched it happen. So my choice is that no violence under any circumstances, none. I will never react to a violent situation. If someone is going to you know, try and shoot me, I will try and avoid it. I will try and get out of there. I will try and do everything I can to prevent it happening, but I won't react to it. Now, if someone was about to you know, physically hurt uh, you know, someone else, um, and I was there, I would obviously try and stop it. Uh, but I wouldn't try and hurt them. I would try and prevent it. You know, they may get hurt in the process, but it wouldn't be a willful hurting. I would do everything I could to prevent it. See, these degrees, these nuancings of reaction to violence are what are important to me, complex thinking, as I said. Just for me, it's a problem to say, 
Um, there are some exceptions to my pacifism uh, because uh, no, because if for me there are no exceptions to pacifism, I'll always use a pacifist approach. So if someone is violent, I will try and deal with it with non-violence. Um, I will try and prevent other people or other things or other animals being hurt, but I won't use violence against them. See, as a vegan, um, an ethical vegan, I see, you know, I live in the country. I live. I live out in the bush, and I see many, 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 many acts of violence towards animals, you know, directly or indirectly, every week. Um, now, I don't choose to be violent against those doing that violence, but I'm very outspoken, and I try and change them. Now, were that against humans, obviously, uh, I wouldn't just be verbally outspoken. I'd intervene physically, but I wouldn't be violent towards them. I'd put myself between them and whoever was being harmed. Now, that is my choice. That is what I would do. I've been in such situations and that's how I've reacted. I've reacted under pressure and um, that is how I tend to react. You know, mentally, well, you know, one can get pretty angry. It's like with anything else. They say the murderer can never have um, be tried or um, uh, judged by the um, uh, victim's relatives because obviously they're going to have a very different point of view there always has to be a neutral kind of body judging now as an anarchist i have great problems with systems of um you know, of uh law that are applied in that way but i believe in the natural law i believe there are rights and wrongs i do i do believe in communal decision making about how you deal with that in a non-violent way how you stop crime how you if someone has committed a crime that's dangerous to um you know people's lives how you then keep them separate i have lots of thoughts about that um on the other hand of course because i don't believe in property Crimes of property mean nothing to me. So someone stealing someone's goods um, doesn't get called a crime by me. It gets called something else. There are issues, ethical issues in doing that, and it's wrong. Um, but it's not treated in the same way as, say, the state treats uh, crimes of property. The state treats crimes of property in a very severe way because it threatens the very state itself, which is built on the notion of property and division of uh, ownership. Even a um, you know, so-called, um, whether it was the, the old Soviet Union, they had very strict notions of property. Uh, they didn't think they did, but they did. Um, it's just the state owning the property. And if you offend against the state, you're offending against the people. Well, the moment the word property and the notion of property enters into it, then you've got a problem. Then you get totalitarianism. So anyway, all of these things are nuanced. Uh, they all they, you can't separate one off from the other, and the same applies to violence. It's um, it's it's a very complex mix. But I choose never to violently react. So, how do you deal deal with state violence if uh, you you don't disagree with like? I guess self defense, right? But I just well, state violence. No, I disagree with any. I'm talking. I'm not only talking about state. I'm talking about everything. Self defense is a, is an interesting notion. Um, if someone is going to punch me in the face, I will put my hand up to block it. I won't punch them back, and that's how I deal with all violence, um, state or individual violence. Uh, it, one is preventative, and one is defensive purely and one is offensive defensive if you know what i mean so there's the old saying in in uh, military parlance that the greatest form of defense is attack um well i don't believe that the greatest form of defense is defense um if someone is physically personally attacking you you have to my mind um, a pacifist right to prevent yourself being hurt but also not to inflict hurt on the people attacking you. Now, that doesn't mean that that's exonerating or saying they're right. I think that they should you know, be held accountable, and I think that um, they should be prevented from doing that, but I don't think they should be hurt, and I think they should be treated humanely because I see violence as a kind of problem, uh, not as... Uh, I, I think someone once someone becomes violent, you can usually trace in them some kind of you know issue of experiencing when they're young or whatever it is. It's... Um, whatever the array of events are and circumstances that lead them to being a violent person. And so I think that even people who are violent have to be looked on with some compassion, um, but obviously prevented from being violent. So defence is a funny word. Um, 
yes, I would like someone not to be hurt, um, and if someone attacking them, they can prevent it, good. But not if they are going to, in turn, you know, hurt back. There are a lot of, for example, a lot of uh, restraint techniques and so on you can learn if you are in vulnerable situations, walking through tough places, and you need to be able to feel intact, which everyone has a right to. There are plenty of self Defences you can sort of uh, utilise that aren't aggressive towards the other person. It sounds strange, but there's a very big difference. Too much uh, notion of self-defence. The American home notion of defending one's home is quite traumatic and terrifying to me, especially when weapons are involved. The idea that, you know, someone invades your space, you have the right to, um, you know, shoot them or something. It's just outrageous to me. Um, you have a right to defend yourself but not to inflict harm the other way. You know, is this possible? Well, I think it is possible. So what, what do you say to the critics uh, of pacifism that say uh, that, that holding this, this type of belief system is inherently privileged because you're not undergoing the, the constant uh, stress of uh, violence either by the state or by other in institutions? Well, you are undergoing the violence of the state. I don't know anyone who's privileged enough to avoid it unless they're very wealthy and they can buy themselves a sinecure of that. Well, I've never met a very, very wealthy person who's been a pacifist, never once in my entire life of activism. Um, privilege and money are, are gifts of the state. You cannot have it. You've got to remember this is a complex portrait we're paint painting here. It's not just one thread. It's mm -hmm. a thread connected with anarchism and it's a thread connected with veganism as well. That's why I always call myself an anarchist, vegan, pacifist because the things are inseparable because the moment you do attain that kind of privilege on that level, then you're, you're interacting with power structures in a very dubious way. So we've all got privilege. I have more privilege sitting here than someone sitting in the middle of a war zone in, um, you know, wherever around the world at the moment. That goes without saying. But that doesn't mean at some point this place might not become that. History tells us that, you know, everything is possible. Um, then my privilege will be, um, you know, very, very different and very compromised. But in terms of the privilege of making decisions um, in which you're comfortable coexisting with the state um, rather than uncomfortable coexisting with the state, uh, well, I, that's not what we're really talking about. Uh, there is, if, if, you're, um, if you're white in um, uh, Western liberal democracies, you're in a privileged position. If you're male in Western, privilege, uh, in Western liberal democracies, so-called, you're privileged. There are many, many um, kind of markers of privilege and I acknowledge they all exist and spend my life trying to challenge them and challenge myself within those various structures. So, of course, it goes without saying that, you know, sitting here saying this um, gives me uh, a, a, an easy position to do so. But that doesn't mean I've always been in that position and I most certainly haven't. Um, without going into great detail. In fact, those who know me well would be amazed that I still am even alive. Um, but it's – so things shift. Our privilege shifts. But, yeah, there are certain markers of privilege that don't change. Being male, for starters, is probably the most massive marker of privilege that, you know, is almost um, impossible to completely overcome, though all our energy should be, you know, not only to bring um, – Gender equality and whatever, however you define gender, and I'm not just talking male and female, I'm talking across a full array of um, identifications. Um, it's not as simple as male and female, and never has been. It's not a, a new discovery of the last 10 or 15 years because of social media. This is a fact of human and uh, all existence. There is never such a thing as just male and female, never has been. So we have to constantly um, analyse and critique our own positions um, whoever we are, because a white woman in the United States is, no matter how bad her situation is, going to be better off than um, most non-white uh, women in the same situation. These are, to me, absolutely offensive situations of inequality and uh, they're unjust and that's what my privilege in those particular circumstances should be used towards regressing reducing my own level of privilege. So, yeah, to get back to your original point about violence and the privilege of not being in that violent situation, 
well, it depends on the situation. I said that right at the beginning. You, you, you can't make sweeping judgments over people in the situations they find themselves in. It's the tiger scenario that I mentioned earlier. I'm the first to admit that and the first to say it. Um, and I don't judge people. I'm saying my choice has been um, since I, you know, became very strongly pacifist to um, not react violently, violently to violent situations. And I have been in, you know, various situations where it's I could have been aggressive back. And I'm a big bloke, you know, I'm six foot three and, um, you know, weigh 90 kilos and um, I can respond to aggression if I need to. I, <laughs> I was in 15 years a very, very, very heavy drinker and other things and many, many a bar brawl have I seen. And uh, so it's not a situation of not being able to react. It's a situation of very strongly choosing not to react. That's, for me, a kind of um, uh, sticking to my morality, to my ethics. And uh, But, yes, you're right. What you say is right. I, I cannot judge all situations I'm not in. But I can make broader observations. And also we're all part of an interaction of um, violence with the state and uh, with the military. This is an ongoing thing. We're all part of it. The military is enacting violence on our behalf every single day, all militaries all around the world. And um, so we are directly responsible and we are directly um, uh, answerable for those violences because <laughs> it's our taxes and it's our um, uh, complacency and it's our just rolling through our lives that allows this to happen. And if we were all, you know, and not by saying this, I'm not having a go at in individual soldiers, um, whatever my personal issues may be with an individual soldier. I, I think that a lot of people go into the military because they haven't got any money. They're in difficult situations socially. The state has created a pathway which they inevitably will take, and one has to look at that in that light. So it's not this sort of, I can't stand the kind of protest situation where you get, where I've been in so many of them when I was younger, where they're all bad, we're all good. Because it's just not that simple. Many of the bad people I've known have been on the side of the, in the you know, protesting against uh, have been more aggressive than the soldiers they've been protesting against. I, I've seen this. I've written stories about this kind of, you know, because I, I write books of fiction as well, and uh, I've written stories, quite a few stories about protest movements, of being in them among people who have been far more aggressive and far more imperialist than the very people they were protesting against, who many times have actually gone through because there's been no other way for them to go and they've got family at home, they're sending money home and all these kind of things. You've got to look at it big. It's a complex, again, back to that word, it's a complex picture. And if you get down to just binaries of good, bad, you know, white, black, good, bad, male, female, those simple binaries, you're going to miss out on a lot of thinking that needs to be done because it's an array and it's never as simple as a, a binary kind of opposition. You, you mentioned um, critique critiquing one's own beliefs and the, the idea of that, that constant self-reflection of getting better. Is there, is there uh, a, a story that you have within yourself of that, that critiquing yourself you'd be willing to share? Yeah, well, I mean, not everything I do is self-critique. You, you, you can't have gone through 15 years of, um, you know, severe addiction and uh, all the attendant behaviours that that brings and the destruction to your family and those who love you. Uh, as you, as they watch you perish, and as you, you know, use them in your um, feeding your addiction, you can't go through that and come out the other end and not be just slightly self-critical. <laughs> Seriously, um, and it's not a matter of the uh, which I've also seen a lot of people who overcome these issues and then they spend the rest of their lives talking about how bad they were, so they can show how good they are now. <laughs> it's not a matter of that because, believe you me, all the character faults that allow you to behave like that as an addict exist in your sober self. It's, it's just how you choose to manage them. And there's no holier-than-thou kind of uh, you're good or bad. It's like this thing of proselytizing when you're young, going around saying, you know, you're all, all evil for eating animals. Um, who's to say? People eat animals for many different reasons and they interact with animals for, in many different ways. Um, I happen to have a view on the fact that you can live without doing that and since you can live without eating animals, 
why do so, and uh, and so on. And, and once again, that has a whole array of thinking around it. But yeah, when when you've gone through life and you and you've done things and you've and you've tried to change your ways, you're not only going to be permanently self critiquing, so you don't lapse back into that, which is always. You know, that's what life is, even if you feel a thousand miles away from it. It's still very close. Um, so inevitably, I'm going to have many such stories. One I'm willing to share, well, I don't know. I've written a lot of them, um, and they've, they always come back and bite me in some way. <laughs> so they, they do. Uh, but I don't know, really. I suppose, what sort of story are you looking for? Because I actually have so many. I just want to... So the, um, shall we say, get this in the right corridor? What, what, what are you looking for precisely? Oh, I mean, not, nothing in, in particular. Um, I just always like the, the idea of talking about the self-reflection so people can, they see it in action because I think it's so important with inside our movements to uh, be not, not only critical of oneself but, but positively critical of each other and helping each oh, other cool. become better. So I just like hearing yeah. those stories because it shows that positive interaction. Well, you see, the thing is, that's a very good point. Uh, positively critical is an incredibly important thing. We, uh, you know, my partner, Tracy Ryan, also a, a poet and writer and a, a feminist um, and uh, vegan, and, uh, you know, we share this, we did this blog together called Mutually Said, um, and we kind of, well, what we do in there is, you know, we, we put poems up and we put articles up and this, that and the other, and it's this kind of process of, critiquing um, uh, the stuff that comes in from the outside world and how we process it and send it back out. But where I'm going with this is behind the scenes, of course. She and I spend our lives talking about these issues and what's extremely good about it is that both of us are able to criticise the other and um, critique thinking um, in very direct ways. There's no, um, uh, you know, especially when it comes to issues, for example, issues of uh, gender and, um, you know, I am very consider myself very proudly um, uh, a feminist, but <laughs> no matter what I do, I am always privileging uh, myself through my position as a male. And, if I, you know, my argument back to Tracy would be I might not be able to get around this. There's no way I can. And she was saying, well, there's no way that you – you are in the privileged position and you have to constantly look at the world in that light that you're always going to be one step ahead um, of many women who would be in a similar situation or whatever circumstance it may be uh, because of the privileging of, of, of the male. So I, and that is absolutely true, and so I'm constantly trying to address, uh, address um, uh, gender uh sort of slippage uh, in um, cause and effect and in terms of, you know, what one gets, how the world treats you. Uh, it's, it's, on, it's on so many levels, you know, whether it's going to a shop, um, you know, to buy your food or whatever um, and how people treat you. Um, it, it's uh, how especially governments, um, even whoever's in power, whether there's a, you know, female head of state or a male head of state is irrelevant. The actual machinery of the state is inherently male. And so in that sense, there's a constant positive criticism that goes on. And it is positive because it's warmly meant and uh, generative. It's, it's, you know, we have a very good relationship. And uh, what she says is true. And I take great notice of it. And so I suppose the, the best example I can give would be in terms of gender and this um, willingness to go through life um, and have my opinions and, and do my activisms and uh, very easily forget that um, no matter what I do, I'm doing it from the position of a male. And it's good to be reminded of that and um, to critique it and self-critique it. So that's a generic and very general example, but it's, it's one that, means a lot to me. And, and the same thing is with uh, in Australia, which has an absolutely atrocious um, uh, racism that runs right through its entire being. I mean, the first act um, of the feder federated government in 1901 was the White Immigration Act. That was the first thing they actually put in place was to ensure, to their minds, Australia would remain white. Thankfully, 
they failed and may they fail forever and continue to do so. Um, but you, you've got to understand that this country is, was built around that notion and the treatment of, uh, by the state of Indigenous peoples in this country is outrageous. It's, um, it's criminal on every level and of refugees. Well, <laughs> there aren't refugees now except for the ones locked up on islands suffering and perishing literally on Nauru and other islands that put them on because, of course, they turn back the boats here. They actually mid-sea, stop them. No one knows what happens because there's a um, gag order on it all, so you can't know what's actually happened to the people who get turned back mid-sea. So this is the kind of place that, you know, we live in. And so, you know, you're constantly um, conscious of your privileged position, A, just being here, um, B, um, you know, if you're non-Indigenous, um, you're living on land that was stolen from Indigenous people um, and it's still their land. Um, so everything, everything is, um, as activists, we have to be constantly self-critiquing. And I thought that your point earlier, uh, was extremely good about, uh, your own privilege because you're right. And, you know, I don't have a million dollars and, um, drive BMW around. <laughs> the likelihood of that happening is zero. Uh, but I have... A kind of comparative privilege, um, and and it's also your point I thought was very good about violent situations, say in the war zone, and how you react. Well, I actually know I would react the same way, but I know other people under pressure, and they have their you know their family and their loved ones, and you know the land they grew up on reacting against violence. Violence is a complex situation, um, and I have to acknowledge that. That doesn't mean I agree with it. It means I have to acknowledge it and I have to factor it into how I react to the world. Because the moment I turn around or any of us in, as activists turn around and say, you know, um, we're good and you're bad, I don't mean we're right and you're wrong because I actually do think they're wrong. I do think people who bulldoze the bush down and the people who are racist and the people who, you know, um, make money out of others and exploit them in that way, they are wrong. But... Uh, it doesn't mean that they're bad to my good. There are, there are many shades in there of, of good and bad, and all of us have a bit of it. Some people just don't mind letting. It, they, in fact, they take pride in uh, what I would perceive as badness um, uh, coming out. And I think we have to look at that and try and understand the psychology behind it. Uh, it's, not, it's not good enough just to react Reacting is a very easy thing. You can get angry and your adrenaline goes up and endorphins are doing what endorphins do and you react. It's not reacting that matters as much as thinking about your reactions and processing them and um, you know, utilising them to the most positive outcome for all involved. You know, even, the, even the millionaires need to have, we need to extend some compassion. And it's very hard, but we must. So on a... On a whole different note, you said you went vegan at 30? Or, no, or I was vegan 20, 30, 30 22, years 30 okay. years ago. How, how well, 23 veganism, I was, actually. How has veganism changed over these years? Oh, well, it's a totally different thing. When I first became vegan, there were no vegans where I was, none. None. I was the uh, – myself, my brother, and uh, my then partner um, were the only vegans we'd ever heard of. In Australia, um, there would have been others, probably in Melbourne and so on, but we didn't know them. Not out in the bush in Western Australia, uh, and it was very, very hard to, you know, to actually make it work. We did. I mean, it wasn't a wishy-washy thing. Once the decision's made by myself, it's made, and I stick to it. So you don't compromise it in any way. Um, but in those early days, on the level of consumable products which were a problem in themselves I won't even go into at the moment, um, there, there was very little, you know, you could eat, basically you could buy uh, bulk, um, you know, beans and bulk grains and those kind of things in, and do a lot of preparation and so on. Now, of course, it's changed dramatically. You know, vegan products are readily available, all the meat substitutes and so on. You can buy them in any shop. And um, though we... Uh, try and do as much as we can inevitably, especially when traveling, you buy vegan products. So um, it's obviously a convenience thing and that 
of course, that convenience is also part of the problem too because the more convenient and consumable something is, the more it's costing somewhere, the more um, you know, damage is being somewhere else, done somewhere else in some way. But having said that, the psychology of veganism is far more acceptable now. And I don't just mean in the um, imperial West. I mean throughout the world in, in most cultures. Um, there's a consciousness of um, that the vegans do exist. Um, hey, it's an amazing change in France in my life. I mean, when I was first a vegan in France, they almost run you out of Paris, you know. Um, now it's perfectly acceptable. So the, the fact it's acceptable. Now, I always joke about the kind of shallowness of the so-called hipster movement and so on, but one thing I will say about it, uh, and that whole kind of uh, generational change that came with uh, a kind of fetishizing of the past, really, a kind of strange post postmodernity that took place over the last 10 years that came with social media and all the rest of it. As much as I criticize aspects of it um, for its consumerist um, uh, underpinnings, um, it has brought a greater tolerance uh, in certain places in so-called Western society, a uh, certain t- a tolerance of difference. And that tolerance is a good thing. Um, so vegans are not only tolerated now, they're quite normative. And, um, you know, what does vegan mean? And some people are vegans a bit of the time and not rest of the time. And some people, uh, you know, are very flexible or flexitarian about it. For me, that's not veganism. Veganism is a life commitment and it's a, it's a full ethical a decision about not eating or using animals and um, for very specific kinds of reasons. So that's not my kind of veganism. My veganism is the old school veganism. Uh, you know, it's Pythagoras, you know, uh, you know, where all this sort of comes from as a philosophy. Um, he wasn't actually even a full vegan. He ate honey, so um, <laughs> which, of course, I don't. But, but having, having said that, he was uh, philosophically um, otherwise uh, a vegan and, um, you know, there was a very carefully thought out system there as everything Pythagoras did was a carefully thought out system. Um, so, you know, there's very old footings in Western, so-called Western thought um, about these things as well as obviously in Eastern thought, um, very much so. But, um, yeah, it has changed. It's just more you're more acceptable. You're not... No, you go out to something that you have to go to, people will cater for you without a fuss and they'll do it well and they'll understand that, you know, you don't cook the same vegetable material and stuff. You've cooked meat, you use something separate, all these kind of things. There is a, and that's also come about because of a greater cultural awareness generally around the world. You know, people, this seems such um, polarized times at the moment where people play an East West clash and all these, you know, this kind of, uh, Conflict of civilizations garbage that was meted out by right wingers um, after 9 11 as a kind of um, in crusades language, which is just absolutely ridiculous and offensive on every level. Um, this kind of violence has long existed. Um, is that and have used it as a, as a kind of tool of control over language and thought, and um, that this is kind of well. In my experience, actually, it's been quite different. There's a greater manifestation of violence in the world at the moment. There's no doubt about that. But there is actually generally much more acceptance um, across all walks of life all around the world. And I've, you know, spent a lot of time in different places of the world, and I have seen that change. And veganism's been part of that, um, which is, you know, fantastic. Um, And if it means fewer animals being killed and tormented, um, then I don't care, you know, if it comes from hipsterism or flexitarianism or whatever, I'm interested in end results. And if end results means that, um, you know, animals are treated generally um, even with more respect and uh, certainly are used less, then it can only be a good thing. So what what is something in the animal rights or anarchist uh, spheres that you see going on that you, you wish would change? Oh, well, do you mean actually in terms of activism? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, there's many things I wish would change. Um, One of the big problems with all um, uh, activists and all collations of activists into movements I've come across is the inevitability of hierarchy. And um, decision-making, to my mind, always has to be about consensus 
And the three of us, I'm sure, who have never met before, I just can tell, even if you think what I'm saying is balmy and you think, you know, this is totally unrealistic, whatever, we can sit and have a reasoned conversation and come to agreements about many things. We could agree to leave the uh, room at the same time. We could agree to have our meal at the same time. We could agree... You know, and so on. We could agree on most things. There'd be some things we probably wouldn't agree we couldn't reach consensus on. But in, in other words, consensus is reachable in nearly everything. It's only very small things. And uh, they may be very large uh, morally and very large to ourselves. But in, in terms of just numbers of things we'd agree with, few would we not come to a consensus decision on. That's I find that even if you mix with people who are, you know, I mix with a lot of farmers and so on who are extremely different views from my own, and um, we can reach agreement on many things. And one of the problems I find with uh, the protest um, and activist movements I've encountered quite a few in my life is that consensus is very hard to reach, and that is out of proportion or... Um, disconnected to what one would be, you know, doing, interacting with those same people in day-to-day life situations where consensus would be largely reachable. And that's because there's an overdetermined feeling in any protest or any activism that we have a particular purpose and we're going to reach it no matter what and we've got to make compromises to get there. And that's not true. The moment you sacrifice that kind of uh, respect for each other, that pacifist kind of enjoyment of uh, mutual decision-making, then you are creating a hierarchy and you are creating a power play within that movement. And so you get um, groups of people who find themselves compelled to act in a way that they normally wouldn't because they're caught up in the kind of zeitgeist of the moment, in the pressure of the moment, because their own decision-making, their own point in the consensus kind of uh, realm has has gone. And that is something I've noticed from the first process I ever went to, which was when I was 18. It was an indige- a, mark, uh, a march in Western Australia uh, um, in support of Indigenous land rights, Aboriginal land rights. And um, I was 18 and very passionate about it. And uh, I realised in that movement um, that, you know, some people were telling people in the crowd how they behave and so on. And I thought, well, they know better. I'm 18. I'll follow it. But then by the time I get to 22, I'm um, on the wharf down in Fremantle protesting against um, the Seventh Fleet and against nuclear warships being, um, and war in general, but against particularly nuclear power and nuclear warships. I'm on my own with a group of my friends, I should say, in our commune, and we're vehemently protesting. And um, I get arrested, and uh, which happened to me a bit, and uh, carted off to the lockup. I'm in the lockup, and um, five parties, uh, five members of the anti nuclear party, uh, get thrown into the cells with me. We're in the cells for you know six hours, and then a very senior member of the uh, nuclear disarmament group comes in. And she bails all the, um, the six women or seven women had been jailed. And they went in my cell. They're in the next cell with, because of male and female separation. And um, they get bailed out. And I say to this very prominent person, what about me? You know, you could bail me. I, I really don't want it. It's a very rough police station. I don't want to be in here. Things happen. I've had them happen to me in here. Can you get me out? And she said to me, no, because she'd actually come in. Normally this doesn't happen. She'd come in to speak in behind in the cells to, and so I could see her and hear her. And uh, it's a very unusual situation um, because so many had been locked up at once. Anyway, and she said to me, no, you're an anarchist and um, you're, you know, we're not supporting you, even though you're protesting on our side um, and for the same cause, we're not supporting you. Um, because we, you are a known anarchist and um, we don't want that image. And I was very upset. I said that, you know, that's a, you're creating a hierarchy within the process when we're here. About, and, you know, what I had to say and why I was arrested, I was arrested for swearing, they, uh, repeatedly swearing, on, and it was televised. Um, <laughs> and this is what's amazing. How's this? We're being, this is what the cop said to me, one of the cops who was an ex-school friend said to me, he said, don't swear, they're filming this for the television news tonight. And I said, fuck off. I don't give a fuck. 
with their filming for the fucking television at the top of my voice and gave finger, which was on the news that night with beep, beep, beep through it. <laughs> and um, anyway, they he said, right, that's it, and I was arrested. Now, I, I ended up being left there and I had to go to court the next day and all the rest. And I was a very – it created a complex situation right throughout my life, all sorts of things come from it. And – I don't have any – don't get me wrong. It's not a matter of resentment against, the, you know, the people who could have got me out. What I upset me was the idea that within a um, very unified movement in terms of it being clearly anti-nuclear and clearly anti-military is that uh, – um, that they could hierarchize in that way because I wasn't being violent. I was being verbally um, offensive and, you know, I, I wouldn't do that now, but I was. I was often like that. Um, and But they didn't want what came with it. And there's an irony to this story. There's an irony. I wrote a story about this. Um, they all talk about uh, in that particular movement, they're talking about, you know, humanitarian concern and so on. Well, I've always felt that I don't judge. Sailors on that boat, I met in Fremantle um, before the protest took place. I met a sailor off one of the off the aircraft carrier um, that was uh, offshore at the time, and I ended up. I was back in my drinking days. And I sat down and had a drink with him because I often talk to people with very different views from myself. And I said, "Look, you know, what the hell are you doing?" this for uh and he said well you've got to understand i come out of a really rough neighborhood in chicago you know um african-american growing up where i grew up there's one avenue of employment and i took it and he said that you know i don't want to hurt anyone i said i you know he was a really nice guy i had a long we spent like eight hours together and talking to him and shook hands and slapped back. And I said, I'm going to have to protest against you tomorrow. And he said, no worries, man, you know. Um, <laughs> no worries. And I, it just struck me that none of those people in the movement who dumped me would ever have talked to an American sailor, would never have actually tried to look into the sociological and demographic and all the other and the racism that that guy had dealt with in his life, the things he told me. And he said, ironically, it was less racist being in the Navy for him than it was being in the outside world because he said there were racists in the Navy, but there were some control mechanisms, um, uh, you know, that defended him, whereas there were none outside. Now, I'm not defending those control mechanisms. I loathe any control mechanisms. But I'm making a point that the hypocrisy um, is that those outside, unless you actually try to have some, see, this is what I believe, unless you have some empathy, I deeply oppose the military on all levels. It's my life's work has been, you know, to, to get everything away from that. But they're still people and they all have their own stories and their own reasons for being there. And they're not all violent psychopaths. You know, there are plenty of violent psychopaths who sign up because they want to go and kill people and do things. They do exist. I've met them too. But there's also a lot of people, a lot of servicemen and women who are in it for far more complex, uh, you know, they come from poverty, they come from, you know, oppressed situations and they're trying, you know, we, one of the great doctors we've known in our lives um, went through and got his medical training as a, because uh, his parents were military and he's a, far left, um, uh, non-violent, uh, anti-military kind of figure. And um, he was trained through the military. So I do think that as activists, we, we have to try and understand um, the other side of the fence. And we have to try and understand the hierarchies that exist on our own side. And uh, it, I find a lot of stuff in... Um, protest movements quite horrifying at times especially when you get the uh black mask mask stuff and people masking up and uh the anonymity rubbish it's you to my mind you've got a position to state you state it um loudly and clearly and and whatever the consequences are you deal with them and resist them but you help be held accountable and the idea of anonymity and um you know the aggression that comes with anonymity and so on and the hierarchy that comes with anonymity um i find really worrying and quite um offensive and even terrifying as somebody who has you know partaken uh, in black box I, I would love to to dive into that but we're 
I think that's a whole other hour long conversation at, at this point. Uh, well, it probably is, but you know, <laughs> it, is, it probably is, but it is an important one. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I will add, I have many had many conversations with those who have chosen to do such things too. And the position I take um, is the same one. Is that uh, in the same way as I extend an understanding across all divides I've talked I've talked about discussed, um, I extend that across that way. What I always hope is that understanding comes back the other way as well, because if we don't have, if we don't try and shift slightly towards each other, then we have no grounds for dialogue and dialogue is everything. But, you know, the the, the thing about anonymity is that, uh, and I have heard many of the arguments for it, I'm not ignorant of them, is that uh, in the end, um, all all communal decision-making, all consensus decision-making is based upon... uh, who we are and the idea of denying and uh, hiding who we are is a contradiction to communal decision making to me there's a gap there that i think is not often seen that if we're not held we don't hold ourselves accountable even in front of the most offensive forces there are which to my mind is the state um if we don't then they succeed their surveillance, which they treasure so much, their facial recognition garbage. I read this article the other day by a marketing expert who was celebrating the fact that soon that drones will be flying around with facial recognition. This is within a year. Facial recognition stuff for um, product placement and advertising for those they can't use telephones on, for those who are missing out. And, you know, this invasiveness of identity um, and uh, pushes one towards the desire for anonymity. I understand that. And in, in activist moments, that anonymity is a kind of preservation of the of power, of self-empowerment, I should say, against the faces of power. I understand that too. But in the end, I think that one actually um, gets past them, outwits them, um, if not changes them, is by uh, letting, letting one's, um, who one is, sort of... Uh, become louder and louder. Um, but that, that's an anarchist, um, individualist thing, I suppose, but it's always done within a um, communal thing because I do believe in community in the end. What we're doing now, even though I can't see you and you can't see me, is a form of community, and that is invaluable. That, that makes this to me, and that's why you know, I'm doing this, is that um, in some way the three of us, even though I've done most of the talking, uh, have formed a community of sorts, even though you'll go away and say, geez, you know, he's really wrong on that or, God, he's got that, you know, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It really just doesn't matter, mate, you know. Uh, what matters is, is, is there's a dialogue of some sort. Well, I, I can't believe that we're already past an hour. Uh, I've absolutely loved this conversation so far, and uh, we definitely have to continue it uh, sometime in the future. There's so many other things I'd love to touch base with you on. But um, how can people get in contact with you and follow your work and, and see what you're actually doing? Oh, well, it's, you know, a lot of my work is um, available. Here's an irony. A lot of it's available through, you know, big publishers. Um, <laughs> well, this, well, and I've actually, people have challenged me over this, but they're, they're big publishers were, um, and, and many small, um, you know, kind of uh, decented uh, publishing as well. I've published a lot. I've published over 60 books. But with the big publishers I publish with, I will say, people like W.W. W. Norton in New York, big New York publisher, but they're, the people own the company. It, you know, I'm very conscious of what kind of uh, people I'm publishing with. Uh, it's, you know, all the workers, the 250 workers or whatever of it, they actually own the company. And to me, that's preferable to, you know, some Murdoch figure, you know, owning and benefiting from this. So even though, they're, you know, big publishers, they're big publishers with, you know, ethical programs uh, who publish a lot of, you know, very interesting, quite radical material. So my poetry is uh, in, in the United States readily available through, you know, your, your bookshops. The, the kind of uh, critical work I do is usually published by university presses, um, and uh, books like Disclosed, you know, um, uh, Poetics and Activist Poetics, Anarchy in the Avon Valley, um, which is probably the book that most expresses what I've just been talking about from refugee issues through to um, anarchism. Um, that, that book is the one. Um, but there are others as well. But, uh, you know, Activist Poetics, that's what it's about, being a poet and an activist. Um, 
But really, you know, um, I don't like the idea of anyone spending anything, really. I like knowledge to be available. Uh, and on our blog, Mutually Said, it goes back to 2008. There are many, many articles. There's an interview on there done by Tracy 16 years ago with me on um, anarchism. Um, it's on there. There's all sorts of bits and pieces, but it's readily findable. Um, you know, I, I've written and spoken a great deal on these issues. It's what my life is. Uh, but um, I, I'll say one thing, when, you know, because I have enjoyed this. And as I said, I'd, I'd like to have the conversation the other, other way and actually ask you the questions and interview you guys. That would appeal to me a great deal because then I'd understand you a lot more. Um, so maybe that's something in the future because I could give you lots of questions, especially regarding the, la- the, the latter part of our uh, you know, interest. <laughs> well, because, you know, a lot of people I've known and I'm not – because the thing is I respect anonymity in the sense I'd never, ever out anyone, never have, never would, never. Um, and I know people who have been in such positions and profoundly disagreed with them, but I would never turn around and say that's who that is or whatever. I just wouldn't do that. But having said that, um, I am fascinated by the um, good people I know. Good's a wonderful word, isn't it? Good, good people I've known, uh, all, all those um, who have made such decisions. And I'm intrigued why those decisions are made because usually they're people who have a deep sense of um, resisting hierarchies and a deep sense of, um, you know, resisting any kind of uh, um, uh, feeding of the violence machine of the state and so on. So that's something that interests me. Well, I, I would be totally open to doing that. Uh, I think it would be a lot of fun. So we'll definitely have to set something up. Okay. And hopefully you won't have to worry about getting arrested for cursing, but we end every episode saying, fuck shit, damn. So could Yeah, you well, there us? you go. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, yeah, fuck shit, damn, and, uh, and, you know, fuck it all. But let's embrace it as well. And... Uh, <laughs> No, I, you know, you know, the thing about it is, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm no problem with. I, I can cuss and curse for the best of them, but um, and I do too often. But the thing about it is that that's actually language. Language is a wonderful thing. The origins of the word "fuck." I mean, is it truly worth? Uh, I think I've written an essay or two on it. But you know, language is a uh, use. It's how we use language. So if I scream off, you know fuck you in an aggressive way that feels threatening that's not good play day fuck you mate no worries beautiful <laughs> <laughs> well, well thank you so much uh, and you have no a, worries. a wonderful rest of your day since you're yeah. starting it yeah you too you have a good sleep you wake <laughs> up embrace the day peacefully um, um, and uh, constructively and uh, you know may some um, plants and animals around your way benefit from your being yeah this week you heard Delicate by Joey Berenbach. Right now you're listening to Wave One by Calm Cruise. <laughs> I like how you had to chuckle. <laughs> uh, iTunes. We say it every single week, but uh, this week I wanted to give a big thank you to 5 to 9 for leaving us this uh, pretty sweet review. No podcast before has held my attention like this one. I find myself waiting for new episodes each week. These guys are honest open-minded and curious casual informative entertaining showcasing so many diverse opinions a must listen for anyone with an open mind about anarchism or veganism that's very sweet yeah that's awesome thank you so much i'm over here blushing a little bit now (laughs) so uh go help the show out go rate and review the show on your favorite podcast aggregator itunes is the most popular one uh helps us out tremendously but anything you listen to on it will help out the show and more importantly you know Get a, get a friend to listen. That's uh, the, the best thing you can do for the show. Over on the Twitter side of things, we had some recent reviews of our episode with Josh Harper. Jaffa Girl said, only halfway through, but this is my favorite Witch Side episode ever. Josh is amazing. Aw, this made my day. Massive fan of both Jay's and the podcast. And Wayne A.W. said, just got schooled. Time to take notes and do some reading excellent episode josh was a fucking great episode thank you so much josh uh, i would love to have you on and anytime seriously anytime yeah we really did get school too yeah totally <laughs> i learned so much uh-huh. um speaking of twitter if you haven't yet followed us you should be our friend on all the social medias we're on facebook twitter instagram 
YouTube and other things. So find us, be our friend, like us, follow us, all that jazz. All that jazz. Was there a jazz fingers? I did. Uh-huh. Fuck shit damn. Fuck shit damn. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. (laughs) 